Assalamu alaikum everyone, welcome back to my channel with another reaction video. Today I'm gonna react to the story of Al Andalus. I am living in Luxembourg, but I come from Portugal. I was born in Portugal, my family is Portuguese, so I am Portuguese. <laughs> and Portugal is a part of the Andalus, so just let's watch. But before we start, don't forget to subscribe and also leave a like and a comment if you love to. And bismillah. <coughs> Spain, in fact, is the largest country in the entirety of Europe. And so if you think of it like this, therefore, the Muslims had a very long-lasting civilization in Al-Andalus, in Spain. Uh, their presence was about for about 700-800 years in the largest mm -hmm. country in Europe. We had Khilafah system of Islam running civilization in the largest country in Europe. Why did the Muslims have an interest to go to Europe, to Spain, to Andalus? In the year 711, a man called Musa ibn Nusayr, who was the governor of Africa, took a young man called Tariq ibn Ziyad, who was around 19, 20 years old, and he made him the general of his army, and also appointed him as governor of Tangiers. This was part of the Khilafah decision-making to go to Al-Andalus. Hmm. One thing that Muslim historians write about is a popularized story. In this story, you have a person called Julian. Julian is the Count of uh, Quetta. Quetta is the northeast, the furthest northeast of Maghrib. Morocco is Quetta, furthest northwest is the Tangiers. Yeah. What happened, the story goes, that the uh, Count of Quetta, Julian, had friction, had a problem with the king of Spain, of Al-Andalus, called uh, Roderick. And uh, the alleged story goes that the Count Julian of Quetta had a daughter, and the daughter was sent to Spain to study in one of the schools of King Roderick. And when she was there, she was mistreated in a bad way. And so out of his sense of vengeance or revenge, uh, he wanted to exact against King Roderick of, of Spain. He uh, allied with the Muslims, or he assisted the Muslims in arriving into Al And this is a very popular story. She herself is popularized as uh, Saba Romia. She figures prominently in that early episode of the arrival of the Muslims. And so in the year 711, Tariq bin Ziyad takes an army. He has about 500 infantry, 500 cavalry, and they cross the Straits of Gibraltar and they arrive into Al-Andalus. Gibraltar, you might know, is named after him. It's Jabal al-Tariq, the Mount of Tariq, which they named Gibraltar, named after him. When he arrives, what does he see? Who's there in Spain? Spain is ruled by the Visigothic people. And so, when the Muslims arrived, these Visigoths, many of them, too many of them, embraced Islam accepted Islam because they saw the, uh, the similarity between Arianism and Islam. And others who didn't accept Muslim rule, they fled northwards. And this was mostly the Visigothic nobility. And when they fled north, they arrived right to the top of al Andalus, a place called Astorias, two places, Astorias and Galicia. And these are mountains. And so the Muslims, therefore, when they're sending armies, they're sending the armies in you know, different districts, Seville and Granada, Cordoba, all these places, some are accepting, like Toledo falls quite quickly to the Muslims, Cordoba, there was a long siege, they didn't accept very easily, but they, they didn't go as far as these Visigothic nobility went, right to the top. But the, pro the point was that the Muslims had a very strong cavalry, very strong horsemen, and uh, the horsemen struggled to go all the way up to the mountains. And this is why they thought, well, it's only a few of them, they can't cause them damage because we shouldn't trouble ourselves too much. But it was a mistake. This initial small band of Christians in the Astorias and Galician mountains uh, would grow. And they became, you know, kind of a small power unto themselves. They refused to pay taxes. They were kind of independent, autonomous, small independent, autonomous rule. And so, when the Muslims uh, sent this small you know, contingent to try and uh, engage with them, there was a surprise attack. Now, Christians, they, they depict this battle, Belkobodonga, 
as the spark of the Inquisition, depicted as the first victory of Christianity against Islam in that land. The Muslims, they say, were more like a skirmish, but the point is that the presence there remained in the mountains of Astoria. Muslims, they consolidated power and rule when they first arrived into Al-Andalus. The next year, 712 July, Musa ibn Nusayr met him with a big continuum of 7,000 people. Who else was there? So, who oh, was the Christians? Who were also Jews? There were Jews living in Spain. How were they treated? They were treated very badly. So, before the Muslims arrived, what was happening with the Jews? The Jews were persecuted. And so, when the Muslims arrived, they saw this minority of the Jews and they gave them rights. The Jews were not allowed to have synagogues, the Muslims were allowed to rebuild their synagogues. And the Muslims made a very famous treaty called the Treaty of Theodoma. This is why you have Jewish historians like Zion Zohar who says that when the Muslims crossed the Strait of Gibraltar, they, the Jews welcomed them as liberators from Christian rule. Now, in, in the Treaty of Theodoma that they made with Visigoths, yeah, the Catholics, they had rules not to destroy churches was one of them, not to break crucifixes was another one of them. Not to disrupt them on their national holidays, like in Easter or Christmas time, was one of them. Uh, and it was really welcomed, welcomed by the Christians because they thought, well, that's actually a great deal for us. Uh, they could worship in their own ways, in their, in their own places, but of course, under the rule of, of Islam, the Jews had their rights and really seemed quite a, a good deal for people. Except, of course, for the Christians of the north, and they would grow and they would grow. Now we come to the 720s. Uh, the Muslim ruler was a man called the son Ibn Malik al Khawlani. He took his uh, army and they went to Toulouse, in France. They, they, they're taking Spain and they're going pushing further north into France. They get to Toulouse. And in Toulouse, they meet an army fighting under Duke Odo of Aquitaine. And, uh, they, and they have a victory. They defeated the army of Duke Odo of Aquitaine. Some Ibn Malik al Khawlani is celebrated as this great, uh, you know, fighter, general, but Duke Odo of Aquitaine was present in the, in the battle, but then he, he, just, he went, he vanished, he just went away under secrecy. And they thought he had left, he had not left, he had gone to receive help from a man called Charles Martel. Charles Martel was the, like they call him, the Prince of the Franks, but he wasn't interested. So uh, Odo of Aquitaine is telling him that you know, we could, the Muslims are just coming because they've taken the whole of Spain and they're coming north, they're going to take... Uh, France also, he wasn't interested because he thought they're not that powerful. They can't do that. Because remember that France was the Christian base. The, the Pope lived in France. Uh, the church was very really? strong in France. And so, not interested. And so Duke Oda then returns. And when he returns, a surprise attack against some Ibn Malik al Khawlani, and he's martyred there. In 730, the new Muslim you know, governor called uh, Abdul Rahman al Ghafiqi, Rahimullah. He uh, takes his army and they go to Aquitaine itself. So the, the power base of Duke Odo of Aquitaine, he went straight there to Aquitaine itself. And, uh, and when he gets there, again, there's a, there's a defeat of, of Duke Odo. Duke Odo is not there, they go as far as Bordeaux. This is France, you know, this is like they're going further north and, they, and there's a victory. Now, Duke Odo, <coughs> what does he do? He goes back to the same person that he told him, not interested, goes back to Charles Martel and he said, look, you told me that they're not strong enough, but they've just defeated us all over again in my power base of Aquitaine, so please send us help, reinforcements, do something. Charles Martel now, he listens really carefully, strong. and he agrees a date to engage the Muslims in battle, in the year 732, in a very famous battle called the Battle of Tours, this is mid-France. So what happens in this Battle of Tours? This is uh, the most decisive battle the Muslims will have with the French in France. It's like it's winter. It's like October, November time. It's, it's cold in France. And the Muslims, when they go there, uh, they don't know where Charles Martel has arranged the battle. They don't know the location. Charles Martel had been preparing for the Muslims since 721. Now it's 7.32, he knows who they are, he knows the, the way that they fight, he knows the armament that they have, he knows the weapons that they have, and so what he does is he chooses the location of the battle, okay, it's on a hill. So the Muslims have a very strong cavalry, he has a very strong infantry, and so 
the horses of course would struggle to come uphill. He arranges his army on the top, under the cover of trees. So the Muslims of the Mahan Rafiq in his army, they, they're there, you know, with the horses, they're looking up, and that's where Charles Martel's uh, army is, but under the cover of the trees, so they can't see exactly where they are. Second thing is, when Charles Martel approached the battle scene, he went small roads, not the big roads, the small roads under cover of darkness, so they couldn't see what route they would take to the battle site. Number three, they were prepared for the winter. It's prepared for the winter, they had good clothing, they could last the siege, but the Muslims, uh, they're struggling because they don't have the right clothes. This is very cold, and uh, one day is two days, three days, four, five, six, seven, eight days, and it, it, it's too long, now they have to make a move. They have to break that deadlock, and so, Abdul al Fiki says, let's just march upward. Now, Charles Martel, he arranges his battle in what's called a flex, a rectangular mass of infantry. The idea is, therefore, that there's always reinforcements in the phalanx. When the Muslims marched upwards to get to the top, you know, where they are, the men just marched downwards, and the horses, of course, struggled to come upwards. And so they were really um, outmaneuvered by the Christians. It was a very decisive victory for Charles Martel. And he was uh, really lauded you know, by the Christian world as Charles Martellus, Charles the Hammer, they called him, Charles Prince of the Franks, they called him. And that is the furthest point Muslims would ever get in France. So you know, they, they, they tried Bordeaux, Aquitaine, and Toulouse, but not further than Tours. And this is 732. In the 700s, they're just on consolidating their rule, they're building their army strong. So as soon as they capture a place, they appoint a governor. And then within six, seven months, eight months, they appoint a new governor, a new governor. And it's too many governors. To stick. So they can't therefore stabilize their rule because it's just a, a sequence of quick successions of governors. But they're, they're doing good things. And so the first capital for the Muslims of Andalus was, was Seville. Not for long until they moved to Portoba. And remember that Muslims, when they went there, they never seen something so beautiful. But when they saw Spain, I mean, it's, it's a wow, what on earth is that? And they fell in love with it. What happened in 750? Something very big happens. In 750, you had the uh, Abbasid Revolution. And so the Umayyad Khilaf was based in Damascus. The Abbasids uh, had a revolt, and they took power. And you had the beginning of the Abbasid Khilaf. But there was one boy who was 19, 20 years old, uh, who survived. They called him Safar Quraysh, the Falcon of Quraysh. And he, uh, he fled together with his brother and his son and his two sisters. They fled together. And the plan was to follow the Euphrates River. He's a Berber, so he has like orange hair. You know, so easily recognizable. And so the Abbasid sent mercenaries out to try and track him, find him. Going from Damascus, Palestine, Sinai, until they get to Egypt. Uh, the mercenaries catch up with them. And so they, they, they kind of put themselves in the Euphrates River and they tried to swim to safety. Uh, but his brother couldn't swim too well and so he swims back to shore. The Abbasid, the Mercians are waiting for them. But he has no choice except to carry on going and so he carries on going. Now he has a slave with him, a, a Berber slave uh, called Bazar. He, he leaves his sisters behind in, in a caravan because they're less likely to be harmed. They get to Egypt. Now, in Egypt, there is a... Um, a Berber, there is an Abbasid governor, newly appointed, who used to be Romanian loyalist, but now he's Abbasid supporter, and he sends his mercenaries trying to find these two, uh, Abdul Rahman and his servant. And um, they escape him, and they arrive in, in, in Morocco in the year 755. This is five years, it took them five years since the Abbasid revolution wow. to get to Mahalad. Now. The great bulk of Muslims in Al-Andalus are Syrians. That's where the Umayyad and Khilafah was. He had the Umayyad dynasty based in Damascus. And so what he does is, is he sends you know, his servant, Badr, to go to Damascus and find out like a reconnaissance mission, will they accept him if he comes into, into Al-Andalus? And so he goes there and he says, you know, it's good ground for you because they're waiting for someone like you to lead them. And so when he, he goes there, crosses, they welcome him and they appoint him and he becomes the Umayyad ruler. So now it's a big
bit odd because you have the Abbasid Khilafah dynasty, you have the birth now of the Umayyad Khilafah, and then you have another one which is the Fatimid Shia, they have their own Khalif. These three kind of power bases at the same time. But he does a beautiful thing, Abdul Rahman, because he, um, he deals with the people with, with justice, and they love him because he's from them. You know, the most important ruler was not Abdul Rahman, the first Akhul Quraysh, it was in fact. Uh, Abu Rahman the uh, third. He was the most celebrated Muslim ruler. He was a caliph, and he really transformed uh, Al Andalus. Abu Rahman the third worked with Jewish people as well as Christians. He made, in that time, what came to be known as Convivencia, which is a coexistence of Muslims, Jews, and Christians together, building this amazing civilization. He had a Jewish diplomat called Hasdai Ibn Shaflud. He would send him to major centers like Constantinople, Rome. Uh, to bring them in and see the splendor of Al-Andalus. What was happening in Al-Andalus? The Muslims of Rahman the third, a great idea, great thinking. One of the first things he did is, was he reduced the taxes upon the people. And so therefore he dealt with them with, with a lot of mercy, with a lot of kindness and goodness, and they really began to love him. He sought to do away with division. So rather than having independent rulers thinking about one, one single rule, he did that. Qurtaba was the capital of al Andalus, so Seville so for a short time, and then Qurtaba was the main city. And Qurtaba became known as the city of lights. Qurtaba was the first lighted lamp city. 10,000 lamps in the city of Qurtaba. In that one city, you had 300 libraries. 300 libraries in one city. 600 masajid. What? In Qutb. Abu Rahman the third, oh, the I want the to visit. library of 300,000 books. Putting the emphasis on learning, he sets up Makatib, Makatib for blind students, Makatib for disabled students. Wow. It was the Madhab that was in, in Spain was the Maliki Madhab. Yahya ibn Yahya al Laythi was the Maliki Imam of, of Al Andalus. He studied the Nawatha at the feet of Imam Malik himself. Uh, they made beautiful homes and houses, irrigations. From Seville you had Abu Khair. Abu Khair authored his Kitab al-Falah, Falah, the book of farming. Uh, Ibn Awam al ishbili he, he wrote a book describing more than 568 types of plants. These people were geniuses. They were scholars in their own fields. Yeah. You know, in Seville, was the golden you had age. women, uh, Falada. And she worked on manuscript illumination. She was a poetess. He had so many others like her. You know, you had great people working in those lands. Qurtaba, for example, you had science. Mm -hmm. Zahrawi, the master of surgery of science. You had uh, uh, yeah. Ibn Sina, again, philosophy, okay. science. Uh, the work on ethics, for example. Uh, Ibn Rushd, Ibn Rushd, Ibn Zawar. These were from Al Andalus, yeah. Imam Al Qurtubi, the Imam of. Great scholars are emerging, scientists, luminaries, and so all these great personalities, Muslims are emerging. You know, at the same time in Baghdad, what's happening is you have the Darul Hikmah. Darul Hikmah uh, is uh, another place that's a land of wisdom, that's a place of learning. So you had uh, Al Khawarizmi, although algorithms are named after him. So also from him is algebra, because of his book, Kitab al Jabak. So what's happening therefore is that when the Muslims are creating all these amazing things <coughs> in the Western world, uh, they don't have anything. Mm -hmm. no, no Not even toilets. Not as much as the Muslims have. And so you have yeah, Westerners who are now traveling all the way to Andalus and they're learning from the Muslims. Yeah, they were dirty. Uh, famous names like um, Petrus Alfonsi. <laughs> and then he traveled northwards, went to England, he became the surgeon, I think, for King Henry, and he introduced to the Western world what the Muslims are learning of science, of mathematics. Michael Scott was the one, I think, who translated the astronomical tables of Al-Khawarizmi. So the Muslims, therefore, for this period, are really focused on learning, on learning and building the civilization. Mm -hmm. uh, Abdul Rahman III builds a new city called Madinat al -Zahra. And they built this city yeah. from scratch in one year, an entire new city. And uh, the whole city was able to show the Western world, they would bring in these diplomats and dignitaries to see the splendor of Al-Andalus, a new city just for the purpose of, of pomp. 
is quite sad actually, to be honest with you, it's quite a sad thing because although a lot of achievements are being made and a lot of things are happening and people are starting to reflect back on it and they say, well, what was it? where were things going wrong? Um, well, at one point, uh, you, you run the risk of turning the elegance into excess, elegance into extravagance. Who's heard of Masjid Qurtuba? At that time, it was the most grand mosque in the world, Masjid Qurtuba. Really? Right now, it's a chapel. And so, you know, after this great period of, uh, of strength, this great period of, of wonder and science and maths and astronomy and learning and reading and literature, all of this, uh, soon enough, the Muslims, they descended into, into division. And so all these, these major city centers, Seville, Cordoba, Granada, had autonomous rule. Now, who is really most happy with this? Of course, it's the Christians of Galicia and Astorians. It's the one with just a few in the beginning, the Visigothic nobility. Now they've grown. Hundreds of years have passed. They've grown in power and strength. And so now they're coming down and they're fighting against these centers rule and they're fighting some against the others. The Muslim rulers are so uh, concerned that they stay in power and every year they're paying an annual tribute you know, to stay protected and safe. You know, that's like the beginning of the downfall. Division. That's the beginning of, of the downfall for the Muslims. There were efforts, alhamdulillah, you know, by uh, people like Yusuf Ibn Tashifin from the Maghrib this is like in the 11th, 12th century, beginning 12th century. They would invite him from the Maghrib to Al Andalus to fight the Christians with their help. And then on three occasions they would say to him, you know, go back home now. We don't want you here with us. On the third time, however, he stayed there. And he, uh, he, he defeated these Muluk al Tawaif and he brought back the semblance of the previous unity that existed. And that lasted for a while. Until the Muslims had one very crushing defeat in the year 1212 in the Battle of Las Navas to Tolosa, uh, and they never recovered really from that defeat. That was the that gave the Christians the, the biggest, uh, you know, the biggest stronghold against the Muslims. And then really, what followed, uh, you know, in the, in the next centuries or so, is uh, the Muslims were losing their lands. You know, they lost Seville 1246, 1247. Even before that, I mean, James I of Aragon <coughs> expels 100,000 Muslims from Aragon. Muslims have to wear different colored clothing to be recognized as Muslims. Muslims are charged higher taxes. Muslims are not allowed to live in the city center, they have to live outside. You had walled compounds. They lose Seville, Aragon, Arcos, all these places and they're finding their last place of refuge in Granada. And then, you know, you get to like 1501, this is even before the Muslims get to Granada to make it their base, there was a big fire in Granada, 1501, the great fire of Granada in the cap in the city central Granada where they burnt all the books. So all the books we're speaking about, in a grand fire, they burnt everything. All the Qur'ans, Hadith books of tafsir, books of science, except the ones that were gold and silver binded because they could use it to make money. But they just burnt everything. And so then began the process of, uh, of Muslims living in secrecy. This is a sort of really remarkable episode in the history, the history of the Moriscos. The Moriscos were the Muslims who outwardly Catholics, but inwardly they were Muslims. Everything was prohibited. Now they get to a stage where Arabic, and so they sought to ban Arabic for all people. And so you had this great period of the Moriscos. So 1501, all the books are banned. They all get to Granada. One, one good thing was the fact they take all their skills with them, right? So all these scientists and scholars, they all go to one city called Granada. And they make it a beautiful city. They build the Alhambra Palace. And you might notice all around the Alhambra was, the, was written everywhere. La Igali, illallah. There's no victory except Allah, no victory except Allah everywhere in the whole of Alhambra. But of course, this where they got to was a consequence of some things, you know, in this whole period the Crusades happened. This is another reason why the Christians became so strong. A lot of evidence that the, the first crusading front was Spain, not uh, the Quds. And so, you know, they couldn't survive very long. You know, at the end they, they, they made terms, you know, with the Christians. And that was really the end of, uh, of the Muslim existence in 
when the Quran says uh, these are days we all turn on to people. There was a very famous poet called Akul Arundi, wrote a poem at the fall of Seville. He says, everything, you know, nothing reaches its perfection. Right? Everything has a fault, has a defect. Nothing will last forever. Everything will come down. And these lands, he says, were not supposed to last forever. Qabun, that Allah mentioned in the Quran, where is all this gold today? Where is Ad and Thamud, these great, terrible, tyrannical civilization? Where are they today? How many scholars passed through Qurtuba once upon a time? Where is it today? He says, for all of them came something that they could not return from until they passed, and it's as if they didn't exist there in the first place. Meaning death came to every single one of them. And then we will pass as if we weren't even there in the first place. And this was a reminder, therefore, not to lament, not to feel defeated, no, to learn lessons from. And Spain really is the only place in the world where I think Islam was established in full and removed in full. Established in full. Khilafa, Khalid, civilization, all of his learning scholars, and then removed in full. And so, a lot of lessons for us to learn, you know, about this place. SubhanAllah, like, they don't talk about uh, Portugal, but Portugal was also a part of uh, the Andalus. You know, like, if you go to that place, as you you see uh, there are some mosques, and I'm really excited to go to visit once these places, because it's really interesting. They were ruling for so long, you know? Really long, long, long. And I told, like, actually my father that last time, but he don't believe this. I don't know, like, they don't learn... People, they don't learn this in school, that this happened. Me, I didn't learn nothing about this. And also there is another story of, I think it's three kings, they went to Morocco, they wanted to, like, from Portugal, I think. They wanted to go to Morocco and they all died. I think, like, Portugal and so many places, they wanted to take the world, but, you know, so many, like, um, times that Muslims they they won like Andalus and also other times you know Morocco <laughs> yeah so that's why you know that's why I think also because when you talk with Portuguese uh, about like Moroccans and Arabians they are like they are like against those people but they don't know really why this is so bad, you know, like, they talk bad, but they don't know why. It's really common, I don't know, if you are Portuguese, you will know it. Marroquinos. You know, we say, like, Marroquinos. Like, for everyone, like, for all the Arabs, <laughs> it's Marroquinos. I don't know why they do that, but they do that. And if you are Portuguese, you know it. And, uh, and this is really bad, because... I think it comes from these stories, you know, the stories of Andalus, the stories of um, of that story that uh, Morocco they killed the three um, the three kings and everything. So it's the story behind everything, and people they don't even know. Like for example, my father, they never learned in school about this, and it's really sad because it's really beautiful because that time it was peace, it was tranquility. It was so beautiful, you know, like... And then after, you, you saw the Muslims, they were tortured. They were treated like, I don't know what, so bad. They could not pray. When the Muslims, they were ruling, they could pray. All the other religions. They could not talk Arabic. What? When the Muslims were there, this was no problem. And so many things they will they will doing like science and everything how that he said the camera the all the material for the surgery um all this uh, how to be clean i mentioned toilet because this is really important that people they know it's really true europeans i i mean like these places france and spain portugal everywhere they were dirty they were pooping outside. They were putting poop outside, in the streets, okay? Don't tell me you don't know this, because this is so bad. And Muslims, they came, they showed them, there is something, <laughs> there is something called toilet. You can do this, okay? So, <laughs> it's really true. 
And um, so yeah, this is important to know, but people they don't know at all. And it's really sad. Because now they are like this or up. They, actually they think or up and blah 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 blah. But it's nothing special, really. If I go to Morocco, subhanallah, I never saw a country so beautiful as Morocco. Morocco has everything. Morocco has nature. Morocco has big cities, little city, cities that are so beautiful, like Chef Shaun. Um, Morocco has some traditions, it's so beautiful. It has the desert also, the, the Sahara. There's so many beautiful things. The kitchen, mwah, it's the best. I, I think it's the best food on earth. Okay? Okay. Um, food, uh, like spices, I love. And the olives and the argan oil. It's only in Morocco, the argan oil. You know, like, it's so rich, that country, you know, that place where they do the leather. It's really, really special. You don't know, like, if you never went to Morocco, just go once to Morocco. You will see, it's so much better than Europe. So, Europe, it's... I don't say nothing because I live here all my life. I was living here, I was born in Europe, so... But if I could choose, I will go to Morocco, for real. I also love Indonesia, I also love I went there. America, I was there. I like the trees, the palm trees. They were really tall, like really big. But... And the weather, it was good. It's like all stable all the year long, but... I was in India, I loved, I was to New Delhi, I was to Agra, I was to Jaipur, I was Mumbai, um, but Morocco, it's so beautiful. And people, when they think about Morocco, they just think about the desert, about Sahara, about camels. This is all just a little part of it, <laughs> you know, like, there is so much behind. And I think also in other countries it will be the same, but... When I was to Morocco, I traveled a lot, but when I was to Morocco, I find it really special. SubhanAllah. It's really beautiful. Like, I went everywhere almost here in Europe. I'm sad because it's my country, Portugal <laughs> and Luxembourg, but... Like, I love Portugal. I have them, my family, and it's beautiful. It has some beautiful places. This is really true. But Morocco, it has everything and the mountains! The Atlas Mountains and everything, it's the snow, you can do ski, everything, like, everything is that country, subhanAllah. So, yeah, um, that's it. Thank you so much for watching, don't forget to subscribe and also leave a like and a comment if you'd love to. And see you in the next video, inshallah. Nice